a beautiful day. It's a stunning day. And may I say, wow, I put a little video out on Monday evening asking for people to submit questions for a Q&A video. And there are 272 comments. Now, not all of those comments are questions, granted. But there's about 200 questions. And I'm going to try and answer <laughs> as many as I possibly can. I won't be able to do them all walking around the street. Some of this is going to take place indoors, I'm afraid, sat at my desk. But I'm going to go for a little stroll around the streets of Leighton Stone, avoiding Michael's Fish and Chip Shop. Maybe not. And answer this question. Let's get started, otherwise, they're great questions and I'm excited to answer them. Um, Okay, so, so some stuff saying, John, love your work, all the rest of it. And then it says, have you ever considered going on a walk spanning more than one day? Would be good to see uh, for longer form videos. Um, yes, it's a short answer. I've been <laughs> planning on doing a multi-day walk or a multi-day hike for a few years now. And in fact, I think it was 2019, I bought a pack, a bigger pack specifically for that purpose. And as you will be able to see, I've never actually managed to do it. Now, um, maybe this year's the year. I start every year going, this is the year I'm going to do it. So the walk will probably be the Ridgeway is the one I'd like to do. But I might actually do a shorter one that just spans two days. The Ridgeway would be about five days. And so that's a little bit difficult to schedule that time away from the family. Unless I can get them to come with me, which would be amazing but the Ridgeway or maybe the St Peter's Way. I've done uh, two or three sections of the Essex Way, so I've kind of only got the middle bit of that to do, so I could do the middle bit of that. So yes, that is definitely my intention to do that at some point. And thank you, by the way, for so much for all these questions and comments. I, I love doing this Q&A videos, and I massively appreciate you taking the time to write these questions out for me. We have a great one here from uh, Maria in Spain and saying, um, I love reading fiction books that have London as their setting. I'd love to know which ones are your favourites and why. I'm currently reading The Rivers of London Saga and loving it. Thanks for your wonderful videos. Well, I mean, I would have said that The Rivers of London Saga is definitely one of my favourites, if not my favourite London set fictional series. Um, in a similar vein, actually, if you've not read them, I really love the Dirk Gently books. There's only two and they're set around, particularly around Islington, where Dirk Gently lives, and where Douglas Adams lived as well, the author. Uh, so I highly recommend the Douglas Adams novels. And funny enough, when I'm, it's not a, it's a completely different type of book, but in terms of a non-fiction book um, set in London, um, I was really kind of influenced by, in some ways, um, Keep the Aspidistra Flying by George Orwell, which is a great book of London suburbia. Um, so I highly recommend that. That's a, great, that's a great London book as well. I think they're the main ones. I mean, obviously there's so many, aren't there? Books that have used London as a say. I mean, I love Will Self's collection. Well, various collections of shorts that use London. Uh, the Quantity Theory of Insanity is fantastic. Dr. Mukti and other tales of woe as well. They're great London set stories and non, you know, fiction works. Interesting uh, comment, comment question from Martin here, saying, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on wood green and green lanes, managing to avoid some of the gentrification that neighboring areas have faced in the last few years. And that is interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes people do ask about uh, areas that aren't gentrified and, and are sort of still keeping what we might think of as their more authentic, um, feel or character and wood green um, is certainly an area which has been under threat and green lanes I mean green lanes is a very long lane as I'm sure you know running from sort of Stoke Newington up through wood green I think the stoky end of green lanes has kind of been gentrified hasn't it hasn't been overly developed and this is one of the things actually I mean my new book sort of touches on some of these themes isn't it we talk about the changes in London and development in London, but I think that we have to separate gentrification from development because gentrification often just involves houses a bit like the ones around me here suddenly becoming really valuable and people buying them and doing them up and they go from what would have been sort of homes for not necessarily working class but sort of lower middle class people and suddenly now they're going for you know 800 
900 grand, million, 1.5 million, 2 million, crazy money, right? That's gentrification really, and it affects the local businesses and shops. But the physical environment doesn't change, actually. I mean, people paint the houses and stuff, but by and large, it looks the same. The, the big thing that's happening in London now, and but sorry, I should say the side of that is that it displaces a lot of people because they can't afford to live anymore, or their children can't afford to live where they were born, that kind of thing. But then you get redevelopment. You get this weird, like when I was down in Barking Riverside recently, this enormous, sprawling, huge development which radically changed the look and feel of an area. Gentrification obviously does change the feel of an area, no doubt about that. Both of these things have been going on since, well, I don't know, <laughs> not forever, but for a long time, haven't they? Um, wood Green, I think though, I think Wood Green is due to be redeveloped. Now, whether that Come, it has an aspect of gentrification to it or not, I don't know, but it is interesting that it hasn't been gentrified around there because kind of I noticed that around green lanes and sort of, you know the streets off green lanes kind of have been gentrified a bit sort of because it's the lower slopes of Crouch End, isn't it? You know, just over the, the bridge from Crouch End and Hornsey. I used to live up there on Whiteman Road and uh, I feel like that's been ever so slightly gentrified. I feel like there's a little bit of Crouch End creep coming in there but it's interesting here that that's the way you see it because I don't spend as much time up there as I'd like to and I feel like yeah you're right Wood Green Shopping City still got its vibe that it had 30 years ago. This is a this is an interesting question I haven't read the whole thing just a John if you had to um, make a life or death decision on which type of last walk to take would it be in the city or the country your videos always take me back to my childhood and the joy of I felt watching Jack Hargreaves out of town thank you somebody did um recommend the Jack Hargreaves uh, programs to me at some point a few years ago and uh, I watched some of them. Yeah, interesting. I don't know actually. I probably, if it was a life or death, what's it say? Life or death decision. Um, I don't know. It's difficult because if it's a city walk, look, there's more stimulation in a city walk, isn't there? You know, there's more to kind of take in in a mile in a city. You think of all the different ambiences and atmospheres that you encounter. So I'm inclined to say a city walk for that reason. But then again, if I was in a life or death situation, I might want a, something a little bit more relaxing, <laughs> in which case I'd go for a country walk. So, and also I can do much longer walks and country walks as well. So if it's in such a drastic situation, a country walk might be more appealing. Here's an interesting question that I get asked every time I do a Q&A. Um, and I'll keep answering it because I'll probably say different times, different things each time. Um, said, um, da -da -da. have you ever had any ghostly experiences or on your treks uh, as you visit ancient places? Keep up the good work. Me and my partner have had many trippy experiences in stone circles, abandoned w World War II hospital site and ley lines, energy wells. That's a really interesting way of looking at the landscape. Um, ghost experience. I had one which I, rep the, the most profound one I had, and the, most, the clearest one I had is the one that actually I recount in my book, This Other London, and it happened on Hounslow Heath around sunset. And I, I was walking across Hounslow Heath, which at times can be quite a kind of lonely place, not many people around. And uh, I'm, I'm, when I walk, you know, I'm fairly aware of what's around me. I'm aware of my environment. Uh, and this, this lad came up to me and he wanted to know where the, I think it was called the 90 Acres. And he said to me, excuse me, can you tell me where the 90 Acres is? And he was kind of like very pale, very skinny, very pale, gaps, tooth. He sort of looked, to, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, he looked like he might have had a drug problem. Um, but on the other hand, he might have just been not in good shape, but he was not well in his skin, the real pallor to his skin. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, because I thought I'd been researching this area really thoroughly ahead of doing the walk for my book, looking at old maps and everything. I was like, I'm not, I'm not aware of the 90 acres. So I, I, get my, I get my map out and I get my atlases out and I start to answer his question and look for, and, and I sort of give him a vague answer. And then he, he says, oh, thank you. And he walks off in one direction, bear in mind we're in Hounslow Heath, massive open space. I walk on a little bit and I go, hang on a moment, I think it might be. And I turn around to say where I think it might be, and he's gone. And there's nowhere for him to have gone to. And that was a bit spooky. I was like, was he ever there? Was he just a figment of my imagination? Ghostly stuff happened on Hounslow Heath. Here's an interesting thing to follow that up with is um, off the back of that story, I think it was off the back of that story, um, a writer um, got in touch and he was creating a kind of 
drama documentary, fictionalized documentary for Radio 4. And it was about Heathrow, ghosts of Heathrow. And so um, he said, you know, would you be interested in sharing, being interviewed, being sharing some stories? So I, I met him a few times and I shared loads of stories about Hounslow Heath. I said, well, you know, Heathrow was built on the Hounslow Heath. That's why it's called Heathrow Airport. It's a part of Hounslow Heath. So I told him about this ghost apparition, some of the other stories I had. And I'd had an idea of doing a, a TV thing, actually, an original idea for a TV show where I would actually encounter the characters I'd written about. So I'd be walking across Hounslow Heath and I'd meet the pilots who had set off on the first flight to Australia from Hounslow Heath in 1919. I'd meet some of the highwaymen and they recorded some stuff with me over on Hounslow Heath. So I told them loads of this stuff. And they put loads of it into the documentary, but they didn't include any of my interview. So I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't attributed, none of it was attributed back to me. Um, but a lot of the content was in that drama thing. But if you can find it, you might find it interesting actually. I think this apartment building here is where the, uh, the famous TV chef Fanny Craddock used to live at some point in her life. I've always loved that fact, Fanny Craddock living in those flats in Leightonstone. Think about it, it might not actually be this block, but it's one like this in this area. Lovely question from Sean James Cameron, Sean Allotment Gardener. I think his channel's now called Sean's Gardening World. I better cross the road to get some sun on my face as I go down Fairlop Road. Um, and by the way, a question I don't think anyone's asked me, favourite YouTube channels. Sean's is one of my favourite YouTube channels. Sean's Gardening World. Sean's Allotment Garden. One of those. Sean Gardening. You'll find it. Sean says, any plans to finish the London Loop in 2023? And favourite section of the Loop and why? Um, definitely going to walk more of the London Loop in 2023. Um, the thing with my walks around the London Loop, and I'll link to any videos I mentioned, by the way, I'll link to them below. There'll be like a list of related things. I'll link to anything that I can link to. Um, I, I realised recently that, because I've been going around the London Loop anti-clockwise, I don't know why there is a way that you should go around, because it doesn't make any difference. But I started in Enfield, and I've been going anti-clockwise. I did that, I think, I think that was in 2000. And, 19 I think beginning of 2019 I did the first sections and I did quite a few in that first year going from Enfield all the way around anti-clockwise and what I realized is I, I had done other bits of the final section on this side of the river on the north side of the river over on the east over the years out of sequence so although I was doing my London Loops walks in sequence and I've got as far as, I'll put the name on the screen, I can't remember where, it's sort of uh, around the Sidcup area, not far from where I went recently on my Quaggy walk, or that kind of area anyway, that, that section. And I, I don't, what I've realised is really my London Loop walk will end at Erith. And actually I did a video of the final, what would be my section one of the London Loop. I haven't done all of it, but I've done a lot of that in videos as well. The question for me would have been, is there any point in me re-walking the bits on the Essex side to connect back to Enfield, just to do it as part of the London Loop? And I mean, I've done, I've done all of them actually. And in fact, one of them I did do as a London Loop walk. Um, it's the walk along the Ingerbourne is actually a London Loop walk. And also I walked across Raynham uh, Marshes and through Perfleet, which again is a section of the London Loop, but I did that as a, a kind of um, Raynham Marshes walk. So really my London Loop walks will end at uh, Erith. So I think I've got three sections to do. So yes, I will finish them this year, Sean. Favourite section? I think the fa my favourite section actually is still the first one. Um, it had so many different, the first one that I did, which I think is section 13, I think. Uh, and it went from Enfield to um, Trent Park. I loved that section, it was great. It had so many great things about it. And if it hadn't been so great, maybe I wouldn't have carried on with the London Loop. It wasn't my intention to start doing the London Loop. It was just to find a walk I could do. And that ticked the box, so it kept me going. There's so many good sections in the London Loop, to be honest with you. I mean, the section, it's very difficult to think of sections that I haven't enjoyed. And if you've never walked the London Loop, I urge you just to go out. You can download all the maps for free. 
Again, I'll link to the website below from Transport from London. And it's just, it never disappoints. They're always great walks, always great locations. We've just walking over the buried River Fillybrook here. I believe the story of this sculpture here at Lanestone Station is that these bricks are from the houses that were demolished for the building of the M11 Link Road, which is running beneath our feet here and destroyed so many homes in Leytonstone. And I think there is a bathtub encased within this sculpture, which is wonderful, isn't it? And what's, what's great is you can use this sculpture as a place to sit whilst you're waiting for a bus. I'm just going to adjust the camera a little bit there and answer a couple more questions. So many great questions, hundreds of great questions. I'm really flattered that so many people have asked me questions. Um, here's a good one. Now, this, this is one of my favourite types of comments says, it's from Anthony, says, John, I'm a London cabbie and I love your videos. That is the highest praise I can receive for what I do. London cabbie, London historian, like people with, I mean, this guy's literally got the knowledge, you know, just not some knowledge, he's got the, the knowledge of London, which is amazing. Um, he says, have you a favorite place in London to walk? Mine is Deptford Creek up to Borough Market. That's a great walk. Just love the history and hidden beauty there. Look forward to your next video, wherever that may be. Best, John. Um, Favourite place, well really the favourite place for me to walk in the London region is uh, Epping Forest and the Lee Valley. That covers a large area but that's where I'm really drawn to ever since I've moved out here. My other really all-time favourite walk goes from Chancery Lane up to the Angel uh, and that comes from when I lived up at the Angel and worked on the South Bank and I do that walk every night and I had various different routes but like your Deptford Creek walk, it's just so many layers of history, so many stories in such a short space. And that will actually be, some of that will be in the next video uh, I upload with Ian Sinclair, where we did that walk a couple of weeks ago, and that will follow this video, I, I hope, if I finish it in time. So, yeah, that, I would say that territory and Epping Forest and the Lee Valley for a very different type of feel. Thanks for that great question. This is a nice question. He says, I love your channel, particularly, particularly like the balance of background music and the ambient noise from the locations. Uh, superbly done, thank you very much. My question is, where do you source the music from? And is all of it from the same place, commons, etc.? The music comes from, uh, lately, for, for about the last year, I've been using music from um, a website called Epidemic Sound, and I pay a subscription, and for that subscription, it gives me um, access to a massive amount of music, like 16, 20,000 tracks. Some of the music used to come from the YouTube audio library and occasionally do use some of that music. Uh, a track called Patchabelly, which I know many of you like, comes from there. Uh, but I tend to use the service that I pay for. But anyone can access the YouTube audio library. If you search YouTube audio library, you'll, you'll find the content. Here's, here's a lovely long comment. I'm going to read, I'm going to read it actually, because it's from Colin and it's a really beautiful um, scene that Colin sets here. He says, I understand why you trace the roots of lost rivers but I always feel broken hearted to see these culverted, buried, polluted and lifeless watercourses. At weekends, I walk along the rivers flowing uh, from the Lakeland Fells, the Pennines and the Dales. They're inhabited by dippers and wagtails, the sound of waterfalls and rapids and the air tingles with ozone as you walk along them. I was born in the Lee Valley and I started to watch your channel rather obsessively to return home as you try to peel back the layers of London landscape. Don't you ever feel crestfallen by what the Thames Basin has become? I don't feel crestfallen by it, no, because I think a lot of what I'm doing here on the channel is about finding the beauty amongst the mundane, finding the wonderful amongst the banal. So if I were to become crestfallen, it would be very difficult for me to do what I do. So I, I don't allow myself to become crestfallen. You can lament what's being lost, but without being defeated by it, because the, the, you know it's recoverable, right? So if we were to feel kind of a bit down in the mouth about it, then we could campaign for more rivers to be daylighted. And some of them are, you know, including the Higham Hill Brook, which I walked not long ago. So I don't feel, no, I, I see positivity. I feel like these things go in cycles and the rivers will come back, as they do whenever we have heavy rainfall, they burst through the street to remind us that they're still there. But that's a really beautiful comment, Colin. And there's actually a second question for Colin, and I, I will answer the second question as well, because, you know, after writing such a beautiful first question. Uh, my other question is, do you ever fancy uh, doing a great historic walk away from London? I regularly walk along Hadrian's Wall and the last time I was there, I did think this is a place so full of Celtic, Roman, Anglo-Saxon, Viking history that John Rogers would never be able to pull himself away. I would love to do the Hadrian's Wall walk. That's great. I mean, I have done some videos away from London, uh, historic videos. 
Um, I'm trying to think of them off the top of my head. But there are a few. Not, there's not as many as I would have wanted to do. And part of that is logistical as well. Like, I, I probably need to do an overnight. Well, that was, Hadrian's Wall Walk would definitely be an overnight, wouldn't it? It'd be several overnights. So it requires a lot more planning than I, logistical planning, uh, than I currently do. Part of the, the aim as well, when I first started to do videos regularly, was about this being an everyday relatable activity. So initially, the idea was that I would make a video between dropping my kids off at school and picking them up. So I'd do it between nine and three. And actually, initially, well, I would edit them in that time. And I did that for three days, first three, and then I realized oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so, and then that's when I thought to try and do them weekly. And actually, I only really started to do them regularly weekly during the lockdown. Um, and so I still don't want to lose that idea of, at the heart of the channel, that these are walks that you could, that are every day, they're part of the everyday. I'm not going on some epic adventure because in a way that was what my book was about and what the channel was about is, you know, that is a very much the postcard of a walk and an adventure. Whereas you can have adventure anywhere, like here at Leighton Stone Station. But I do love those walks and I do want to get out and do more of them. I want to do more multi-day walks. I want to do the history of other towns and cities in the UK and beyond. Last year I'd made videos in Berlin and Paris. Previously I made a video in Barcelona with my son. Um, so I do definitely want to do more of that. That's certainly on the agenda. I love this question from Duncan and he says I was born in London, work in London, lived in London, now a gentleman of a certain age, have recently moved to West Sussex for a quieter life. Uh, do you think your perception of London changes with age or do you think about London now just as you did when you were in your teens or twenties? That's a great question and I think it varies. I think I'm tempted to say no because I remember that excitement of when I first moved to London as an 18 year old and I lived out in Forest Gate and I was studying down at City London Polytechnic, down at Oldgate, Whitechapel. And when I made the video down there recently, I felt pretty much the same as I did then. Obviously, the more knowledge you gain about London does change your perception of it. So I guess that has come with age. And also, I, th I suppose, like I went out, I had a night out last night with some, with some friends in a pub down in Borough in South London, you know, got home at like half 12, and when I do a night like that, it reminds me of how much of my life in London previous to having kids was, was like that. You know, that was a lot of my perception of London was, was London nightlife. And that now isn't, isn't part of my life hardly at all. You know, if I go out to the pub, as many of you will know, you know, it's here in Leytonstone, just to a local for a couple of pints. So um, that's definitely something that's changed with age for me. Like, my, when I know when I went away to Australia, in my mid-twenties, the London I missed was late night, late night Soho, late night Camden Town. I love that feel of London and that is not part of my London now. So in that sense it's changed. The way I feel about walking around the built environment and exploring it like that, now I feel every bit as excited about London as I did when I first moved here. Because it's a city, you'll never know it. You'll never know all of it. You'll never see all of it and you'll never know all of it. And that's what makes it such rich territory to explore. Somebody asked, how do you remember local facts so well when you're doing your walks? And um, it's a combination, it's a combination. Some stuff I research for a go out and I have some notes that I write on my phone. Um, some stuff I look up at the time. So then I just, I've read it and then I do my piece to camera or whatever it is. Uh, that's why sometimes you have to be like, I believe, I think, or I'll check because I don't want it to become scripted or I'm just reeling off facts. There's no point doing that. Everyone's got Wikipedia now. You don't need me to recite stuff that I could just, it doesn't, you don't want me reading a Wikipedia entry. So I like to ingest the content, absorb it, and then use that when I speak. Uh, so that's how I do it. You kind of have to absorb it and make it part of you. Some of the other stuff is just stuff I have re remembered over the years. And I think it's the combination of taking information into an activity, so into an action, and that's a good way to learn things because then you make a linkage between the place and that information, and it's almost like that information lives in that place. It's, it's buried there somewhere. The memory of it is, is stored in the fabric of the built environment, and it gets released as you walk past it, and that's why sometimes I can't remember that stuff coldly if I'm not there. Once I'm there, suddenly things I've read over the years 
literally come out of the pavement and the brickwork. Don't worry, they don't literally come out of the pavement and the brickwork. What would that look like? Pages of a book coming out of a brick wall. But you know what I mean? That they, they feel like they, I've etched them, engraved them into the pavement through walking those streets, thinking about those things or having just read them. So a lot of it is stored there, stored in the landscape as I remember it. There was a bonus question, I'm gonna look it up. Bonus question was, have you ever left your camera behind when doing walking shots? No, because <laughs> I would know, because I'm making a video, I'm filming all the time, so I would know. Funny thing that happened once when I was, uh, I did a little bit of the Ridgeway a few years ago, I think it was 2016, and I, um, I took two, I think I had three cameras with me actually that day, but I certainly had two, and so I was using one for the walking shot, and then I was doing a piece of camera, I think, as I was walking and I was on a hill, right, so I was in the middle of nowhere and I put the camera down on a, on a post, like a way marker post and I filmed, I'd walked quite a long way away from the camera and, and obviously I was talking to my camera, maybe that was it I was talking to my other camera, so I, I probably visibly had a camera in my hand and somebody who I didn't know was behind me came running up to me with my camera and went, oh excuse me, excuse me, you've forgotten your camera, here you go and they thought I'd walked away and left the camera behind and I had to explain what I was doing. <laughs> it's quite funny. All right, I think I'm gonna to have to answer some of these questions at home at my desk, I think for the sake of practicality. Who knows where we'll get to on this Q&A session. We could end up anywhere by the time it's finished. So I'm back at home. This is not a view you usually get unless you are one of my supporters on Patreon or a member of the channel here where I sometimes record update videos in this, in this very room here. Um, so back in my, and this is where I edit, basically. I did the little uh, the video asking for contributions from this very room. This is where the videos are really made. This is where I research the videos, where I plan everything and where I edit them. In fact, the only thing to do with the production of my videos that doesn't happen in this room is the actual walk itself. So let's crack on with some more questions. This one here, um, it said, in 20 odd years I lived in London, in W2, I never once felt unsafe. With the level of knife crime report in London of late, do you feel safe? Uh, your walks are an inspiration. I feel incredibly sad that I didn't do many of them when I had the opportunity to do. Uh, I am with you every, every, uh, on every stride. Thank you once more. Thank you very much for that, Reaper. That's a really wonderful sentiment. Thank you. Um, no, I really, I really, really ever feel unsafe in London. I mean... <clears throat> I don't think too much about um, reported crime either, because uh, reported crime, you know, um, it's look, it's a it's a long tradition in London of, of reporting, not just in London, but London. I think was probably the home of the tabloid press, wasn't it? There is a, a wonderful um, book about pigs in the Hampstead sewer. I think it's called um, Swine in the Hampstead Sewer or something like that, and it's to do with Victorian sensationalism. I think that's where that tradition of sensationalizing gory bloody sensational things they catch our attention don't they because we're tuned to tune into is there danger am i safe but i you know i don't take i don't tend to let that get on top of me um so no i have I very very rarely felt unsafe there's like one or two occasions where i felt from other people we talk about knife crime the the times i felt incredibly unsafe though is being on the narrow lanes around the outskirts of london when i've done a walk that's taken me out of london it's got dark and i've been stuck on narrow lanes and cars there once you get out to the fringes of london and beyond around essex hertfordshire particularly so particularly essex and hertfordshire not so much the other places but they're they're just people aren't just expecting to see a, a pedestrian in those narrow lanes i mean sadly so few people go walking now um that they drive down there as if they're on a racetrack and if it's dark that then i feel unsafe in a number of times actually a number of times i've hopped through hedges and all sorts walked along river beds to get out of the way of cars i carry a cycle light in my bag now and i put that on my rucksack uh to you know make me more visible in those situations but that's where i felt unsafe not in london outside london not from people but from cars i'm deliberately not planning my answers to the questions. Okay, I could do that. So I like to come up with the answers spontaneously. Uh, so and you'll, when the next question, you'll see why I might have thought about thinking about this a bit more. Hello, John, what are your top five pubs in London and why? I'd love to see an in-depth series on the more obscure old London pubs in their history. Thanks for all your excellent content, much appreciated. 
Well, this is interesting, isn't it? Do I go for the top five pubs generally in London that I think exist or my personal ones? So top five pubs in London. Well, okay, I think I should go for more objective and I have one, I'll allow myself one uh, personal one. Uh, top five, so it'd be the Princess Louise on High Holborn, beautiful old gin palace. That's a wonderful pub. The um, Fitzroy Tavern. Uh, in Fitzrovia, that's a wonderful old pub. That's where Dylan Thomas used to drink. Lots of writers used to drink in there. That's a really lovely pub. Both of those are Samuel Smith's pubs. In fact, actually, I think many of them would be Samuel Smith's pubs. Now I'm thinking along those lines of the Chandos at the bottom of St. Martin's Lane. That's often where I meet friends when we want to find somewhere in central London to meet. We'll meet in the Chandos. You can usually get a seat. Again, Sam Smith's pubs. Hang on, now I need to find one that's not a Sam Smith's pub. Um, I mean, whether these are the, you know, what's really sad, actually, there's going to be none in Islington. I would have said the Albion once upon a time, but the Albion in Barnsbury is now basically a restaurant. That's really unfortunate. The Crown in Barnsbury, I haven't been in there for a number of years. That was a great, authentic, old sort of pub, like 30s wooden interior. Probably also been turned into a restaurant, I bet. So we've got three. Oh, I feel like I need to go for a Soho pub, but I don't really have a favourite Soho. But so I'm going to stick the red line in there. Um, well, I would say the Heathcote and Star, but that's my local, so, you know, I'm going to keep it on for myself. But a more objective one would be the Red Line and Leightonstone High Road. It, it was really tastefully restored about 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, so I need one more. Oh, I kind of want to go for one away from central London. I'm a bit stuck here, actually. What's a pub that I usually go into that I really like? Um, uh, I don't know. I think I'll give you an interesting historical pub. I'll go for the Mitre in Mitre Court, um, just off of Ely Place uh, in Clerkenwell, sort of around Hatton Garden, between Hatton Garden and Ely Place. That dates back, I think, to the 17th century. Uh, that's a great old London pub. That would be in that series. Um, old, obscure London pubs in the history. Yeah, I should do. I mean, also, particularly, you'd have to look at Greater London, right? Greater London as a whole. And that's where you'll find, you know, some really interesting pubs in the old former countryside. By the way, if you can hear any strange noises, that is my dog under the desk, who's decided to clean himself now quite noisily. He's a pug, so he makes lots of nasal noises. Here's a good question. Um, have you considered doing a Lost River Walk with Ben Aronovich? If he's interested, I love his books and would be interested in his inspiration for giving all the rivers a deity. Well, Ben suggested such a thing, actually. I met him the first time a, year, a couple of years ago. And um, he, he watches these videos, he said, or some of them. I think the Lost Rivers videos he said he watches. And, and then I saw him again last year. And each time he said, hey, we should do a walk. Let's do a walk together. So we've never managed to actually schedule it. So that is our intent to do a walk. Um, we haven't decided on a river yet. Um, so, we, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things I'd love to. I mean, imagine for me, it would be a dream to walk a river with Ben Aronovich. That would be incredible, wouldn't it? Sensational. I lived and worked in London in the 80s and it's been interesting to see changes. Have you ever done a walk, got home and thought, well, I wouldn't do that again? Uh, I think I have. What's interesting, I think I have. And then I can't remember where. And then when I, when I reflect on it, I go, oh, actually, it was quite good. Um, Oh, that's tricky. Got home and thought, well, I wouldn't do that again. There's been some, like I say, the ones where I ended up in a sticky situation because it was dark and the roads were very narrow and the cars were just buzzing past. That's where I thought I wouldn't do it again. So whether it's the air, but those areas I wouldn't return to anyway. That's, I might revisit that one later. That's, you've kind of got me slightly stumped, actually, because I don't, if I have a challenging experience, usually it inspires me to, um, I don't know, it usually makes the experience a stronger experience. I'm stuck a little bit there, a good question. Um, first of all, thanks for sharing your walks. Your videos are so precious to me since I lived, since I live abroad from the UK. I know you once said that you've never literally, you've never felt unsafe during your walks. I know, I've just said that again, uh, despite one or two weird encounters. But my question is this, do you have any suggestions for somebody who lives somewhere else? I know you've lived in Italy for a while and who does not always feel safe feel that safe, or at least feels occasionally uneasy. Yeah, I mean, for several reasons, different reasons, not necessarily related to crossing your way with weird, dangerous people. Thanks. Um, have I got any? Yes, I think there's a, there are some sort of general suggestions about feeling s safer when you're walking um, that may sound a little bit like common sense, but 
And by the way, like these are just my personal recommend. I'm not saying I know I'm an expert on this or know anything about it. And I think if you feel unsafe, that's fine. I think you should respect that. I don't I don't believe in pushing people into doing things they don't feel safe doing. Do what you feel safe doing. Otherwise, it's not going to be enjoyable. So for, for start, walk where you feel safe. And there's somebody I know locally here. They, that's why they go to Westfield all the time because they feel safe. The security guards there. It's dry. There's food there. You know, it's a nicer experience. They know they're unlikely to get harassed or anything happen to them there. Um, they like the fact it's monitored by CCTV. So there's, you know, there's lots of different ways of going about finding your safe place to walk. But if you want to go out more and, um, well, and you're going to do it on your own, the other thing is to go with somebody, at least one other person, if not two other people. Walk with other people is a really good way to get around that, I would say. Um, if you if you can't walk with other people and you're going to walk on your own, don't walk with your phone in your hand. In fact, try and keep this out of sight. That will make you less of a target. If you do have to have it out, have it within the the frame of your body. Don't have it over here because that's easier than for someone to... Again, it will make you appear like a target for someone on a bike whizzing past to try and snatch it out of your hand if it's in line with your body. Also, if you must use your phone in the street, don't walk whilst using your phone. That's going to make you vulnerable to all sorts of things. You might walk into something, you might trip on something, etc., etc. People can see you're distracted and they might that makes you more of a target. So if you need to use your phone, stop and stand to one side. Maybe put your back to the street so no one can see what you're doing and they can't get to your device. That's a key thing. I would say always be aware of your surroundings, have an awareness of what's going on around you, not in a nervous way, but be listening, be watching, um, you know, just have a, a feel for what's going on around you so that you can avoid any problematic people. If someone's really drunk and they're shouting, they're causing a bit of a hullabaloo, maybe a couple of people are having a row. So you think, OK, well, I won't go in that direction. Just sort of try and see these things before they occur. Um, and the other key thing, and this is wherever you go, I think, and I learned this when I was traveling, is, you know, try to always look like you know where you're going, like walk confidently. Um, and that sounds a bit counterintuitive I guess if this channel is about sort of wandering around but usually in a city like don't make yourself stick out by looking like you have no idea where you are or where you're going you know like if you're feeling if you feel uneasy if you feel unsafe and you're uneasy maybe you're in an area and you think oh dear suddenly I don't feel so cool here I've stuck people have noticed me if you look like you know where you're going and you just go there I, th I think that's pretty good advice and like I say if you need to stop to work out where you are go over to one side or maybe go into a shop and and find your way there and then you know walk to where you're going look like you know where where you're going and what you're about i think then then the main things i would say that might make you feel a bit safer key thing that i would say don't walk places where you don't feel safe you know respect don't feel like oh john goes walking around industrial estates on his own i want to do that don't do it if you don't feel safe doing it <laughs> yeah it won't be fun i i love it and i enjoy it and i feel like i'm all right but you know, uh, I no, by no means recommend doing that if that's something you feel uncomfortable with. As if by magic, we're down here in the Olympic Park to answer more questions, to keep answering your questions. There's a part of me wants to answer every single question. Now I've answered so many, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure that could be one video. How long would that video be? Um, but I'm going to draw some energy from the, the flowing waters of the River Lee. Great questions, by the way. There's just so many great questions. Thank you so much again and again and again. It's a good question to answer down here in the Olympic Park. Robert asks, uh, you've explored some of the major placemaking new developments in some of your videos, North Greenwich, Olympic Village and Barking Riverside being some. Can you think of any that you have come, that have come before them that you would mark down as a success from Bob and Camilla. Two big fans, thank you very much. Well, the first that really comes to mind, I would say, is uh, the Brunswick Centre. And I was there, I was there with my family last weekend and my son, my eldest son, loves it. And he was going, wow, this is amazing. I'd love to live here. And I think, I mean, obviously they, they um, renovated it not that long ago. And I think they've done, well, I mean, in a way, you need to ask the residents, but that looks great. And I think the Barbican Centre appears to be a massive success. I think sometimes you can judge the success of these by their turnover rates, and apparently, like, people don't leave the Barbican. I mean, people don't tend to leave social housing, but the Barbican, obviously, is a mixture of social and private. 
So I said the Barbican's one, the Brunswick's another. That's just off the top of my head. And I think, I mean, from everything I've read and certainly from what I can see, I think Spa Green Estate seems to be quite a successful development. I don't know if these count in your same sort of thing as place making as such. I think the Brunswick and the Barbican definitely would um, come into that category, I would say. And I don't know, Roehampton is Roehampton. I think Roehampton seems to be quite successful as well. Does it not? It'd be interesting to hear what people say in the comments about that. And Paul asks, um, I'm really curious to learn from whom you inherited your clearly infinite curiosity and passion for history from? That's a really good question. I mean, when you say inherit, it makes me think of my parents. But my love of walking, I think, as I talked about before, definitely comes from my dad. Uh, big walker, grew up walking with him. Well, my earliest memories are out walking with my dad in the Chilterns. So that's a very strong association. I think the old man probably did have a bit of a curiosity of history. I think it partly comes from the environment I grew up in, growing up as I did in the South Chilterns, near High Wycombe near Marlow and places like that. It's so rich in history and I think when you can see that your local history is very much connected to the history of the country, maybe it gives it an added weight when you're young. Like, you know, the Civil War, English Civil War, really starts in High Wycombe with the MP for Wycombe, John Hamden, uh, refusing to pay the ship tax. Um, you know, the River Thames is right there. It was a couple of miles down the road. Uh, which was obviously very potent in my childhood. Shelley's house at Marlow, all these things. You grow up with all this. Disraeli lived in Wickham, at Hewenden Manor. Um, there was so much history there. I think it comes really, I inherited it from the landscape, I'd say. Love this question from Michael. Um, what part of London surprised you the most? Or specifically, where were you when you turned a corner and were just awestruck? And the great thing to say about that, actually, Michael, is it's happened so many times. Um, I couldn't point to, to one, but I think the one maybe I will use as an answer, because you need one, would be when I did the walk for my book, where I went from Lewisham, sorry, I went from Woolwich to the Dartford Salt Marshes, to Darren Creek. And the, specifically, though, when I dropped down from Bostall Woods, into Erith and you walk through a cutting where they cut the road into Erith and you basically see the geology of the of the south side of the London basin all the strata of all the rock through it's just a cross section of you know London clay if you like rock and clay and chalk and it's it's amazing it's an amazing sight and then arriving at Erith on a big wide bend in the Thames with its pier and you feel like you're at the sea it's like I'm in London this is incredible that's probably the, the, the most surprising place in London, I would say, still. And then going out to those salt marshes um, there, sort of through, um, as you go around the corner through Erish Mar, through Erish, Erith Rands, um, Anchor Bay, Erith Rands, <laughs> I mean, it's the Darren Creek with the group flood barrier there. That is astonishing. I went back there, I think it was a year, uh, 2000 and, 22 or 2021 I went back and walked that section again and it is it is genuinely astonishing that's the new East Bank development over there they're still continuing to build and build and build and build in the Olympic Park and they will continue to do so that's a, like a cultural quarter or so they say uh, they've been working on it for ages though Dan Spencer says hi John love your videos as you've done an Oxford video would love you should consider doing a Cambridge one. Yes, I'd love to do a Cambridge one. Don't know why I haven't actually. Ben raises a very good question. <laughs> you once uh, told me you're considering walking the length of the new river. It's a huge task. Do you think you'll ever do it? And what's the lifespan of your walking boots? I felt that they were related questions. Um, yeah, I will do it. I will do it. I don't think I'm going to do it in one go though, because I think it's too long. But the thing is, I have done walks of that length since I first thought about doing it. I, the first really long um, Lee Valley walk I did was when actually I got up really early to do the New River walk, which is about 29 miles, I think. And I got up early enough to do it, but I just thought, oh, no, I can't be bothered to travel to Islington to start a 30 mile walk. So I did it from home. That day, I think I walked 23 miles. I think it might have been the first time I recorded a 23 mile walk. And then uh, in 2020, I think it was, I did a walk that was about 32 miles up the Lee Valley. So I've sort of shown that in, if I've got enough light, or well, even, I mean, the thing, you can't really film in the dark. I did a walk up there not long ago, actually, and I did the last bit in the, you can walk in the dark, that's fine. Along there, you can't film in the dark. <laughs> 
it's just, it's just black up there. There's no light at all. So um, I wouldn't really want to do a substantial portion of it in the pitch black because the footage would be rubbish. So I think I will, uh, yeah, I will do it. Maybe, you know, every year, it's a bit like the multi-day hike. Every year, I think this year is the year I'll do it. And the next part of that question about the lifespan of my walking boots, it does vary a little bit. I should be able to measure it really in miles, shouldn't I? I think you get about a thousand miles out of a pair of walking boots, so it varies really. I, don't, I wear, now I, I vary them depending on the season. So I've got the waterproof ones I wear for muddy walks in the winter, and then I've got sort of uh, breathable ones for the summer. And I'll often walk, use those in sissy walks. So I don't know, I get a couple of years out of them. I get about two years out of a pair of walking boots now which is good, which is good to know. I'm looking for a question left by my friend Dan Fryer and I can't find it. I've just gone through every question. I can't find Dan, I can't find your question. So apologies, the wording isn't as good as your original question, but I remember it because I saw it. It was one of the first ones in and I thought, I love this question. I'm just gonna walk under this bridge first because I lose all the light. Dan's question, great question. And he was saying, if um, words, words along the lines of uh, relating to the Ben Aronovich Rivers of London books, where each river of London has a deity, which is a real person living and breathing. And he says, John, if you could be a deity of any river, which river would it be? I love that. I don't know if you asked Dan, I think you might have said as well, what would your characteristic be? Um, anyway, if I could be a deity of any river, it would be the River Wye that runs through the village where I grew up. It rises in West Wickham, flows through, flows through High Wycombe, through industrial High Wycombe. It drove water mills all along its course as it w uh, wound its way through the villages, through Loud Water. It's a great name for a village, isn't it? There's a few Loud Waters around, I think. And then through Wooban Green, where I grew up, through Wooban Park. There's great stories around there. I, that may be the third book that I publish. <laughs> having not published the second one yet, and then makes its confluence with the Thames down at a place called Hedza. I would be the deity of that river. Well, I, I think you worded it better about the characteristics. Um, I think I'd have to be like a man in a pub, wouldn't I? I think I'd always be found in the corner of a pub with a book, a pint of ale and a packet of crisps. Something around that, yeah, and with a beanie on. And <laughs> that would be my, uh, that's the river god I would be. John asks, and this is interesting, John's from Edinburgh, and he says, do you enjoy every bit of the walk or other parts of it you want to hurry through? Or is it possible to find it something to like anywhere? Uh, my reaction to that is not to do with the place, but it's more to do with the process of walk. And this is the same, whether I'm filming it or whether I'm just going out for a stroll. And I find the bit of the walk I find the most frustrating sometimes is the first bit, is when you're getting started. There's a point when the kind of, the kind of magic of the walk takes over and that, that's the thing, but it doesn't always, it doesn't happen straight away. It takes time. And that's the bit I sometimes, what I wanna, I get impatient with the walk to actually start. And there's a point where you feel the walk has now begun. And that's the bit I love. So getting to that point is the bit I get a little bit, mm, you know, not so keen on. Good question, John. Um, this is a, I don't know if it's a question, but it kind of is a question from Mark. Just inquiring if you were aware of the Friends of West Ham Parks campaign to stop the City of London Corporation developing the old plant nursery site next to the park with a block of flats. There's an online public consultation meeting tomorrow evening at 7.30. I think we've missed that now because it was Tuesday. But I, if there's a link, if I can find a link to that, I'll put it below. If not, Mark, if you see this, if you could put the link below, it'd be great because if we can leave our comments because that sounds like local people don't want that development to happen and, you know, let's get behind them. Uh, Martin says, while making your videos over the last several years, what ways do you feel this process has enriched your life? That's a really good question, um, Martin. I think the act of making the videos has given me this connection and this sense of community, which you, don't, you just don't get. If you're just going out for a walk on your own, uh, you might take photographs for your own amusement or to show your family or whatever. Um, but you don't get this sense of community and engagement and connection that we get through doing this. Um, and that's definitely the way, that has definitely enriched my life enormously over the last several years of making these videos. Being able to share these experiences with you and being able to have this kind of conversation, which admittedly, okay, it's a conversation which happens in the comments um, and it sort of becomes a dialogue in that way, but it definitely it, it becomes real in my head that when I'm out walking, I'm very aware of the process of sharing it with you and communicating it to you 
and yeah engagement and this that's been it's been everything it's been fantastic you know um, and thank you thank you so much and thanks for the great question I'm not sure about the framing of this. <laughs> Where do I, is, is this a bit of framing like that? Or do I get it? If I stand here, top of my head, if I go here, a bit like, you'll forgive me, won't you, for the poor framing. John, what motivates you to keep making the videos you do and how much planning time does it take to make your videos? Thank you, Brian. That feels very much related to the previous question. What motivates me is a couple of things, really. Uh, the first thing I would say is the need to create, the need to be creative, the need to make things. I love making videos, and I think I found a form here which encapsulates many of my interests. Um, and that relates to lots of, if you look at a lot of the other questions about the music, for example, I love music. So I get to bring music into it. Obviously love history and reading and literature and walking, all of those things, really. So it embraces uh, everything not everything but most of the things that i'm interested in and i need to make stuff so when i have a break from youtube like i have regular breaks now every five or six weeks i take a week off i don't stop making things <laughs> i just direct that energy into other things i try i'm trying to use that time to work on the book really is what i'm doing with it but if for whatever reason i don't then i do other things as well so there's never a point where i'm not making and even that point sometimes i'm making videos for myself or i'm trying experimenting with things or trying new forms out so that's the primary thing and uh, relating to a previous answer is it's the engagement you know I wouldn't want to give up this engagement with people the act of making videos sharing them seeing the great comments and then picking up on those comments and making a video which relates to that having conversations with people in the street and in the pub who enjoy the videos and they come up and they tell me things tell me great information people send me maps and things like that that dialogue that that Constant engagement is something I find incredibly enriching and that also motivates me to keep doing this, to keep making videos for YouTube, as opposed to what I suppose a few years previous that I was more focused on trying to make projects, films, documentaries over a period of time and showing them in festivals and then they eventually ended up on YouTube and you'll see them, there's a playlist of the four of them there um, and that those four films cover a period of nearly 10 years so they take a lot longer and you don't get the same type of engagement, really. You finish it and upload it. Whereas this is an ongoing process. This is continuously ongoing. And I can't see a time when I won't want to do it. So, yeah. I feel like I want to frame differently for the next question. What's your inspiration for the path you've followed? What's your favorite place, piece of old London? Uh, I've been a long time subscriber and you've helped me get through some dark times. I really appreciate your content. Thank you very much, Peter, for that. That's another thing when people say what motivates you. Comments like that, people saying that it's helped them, that it's meant a lot to them. The fact that I might be doing some good from this means the world to me. And that alone, actually, would keep me doing it. And I'll be honest with you, there are definitely weeks when I don't fancy it, <laughs> when I'm a bit tired. And it's a, it's a bit, of, you know, it's a little bit of a performance, isn't it? You know, I'm speaking all the time. I'm narrating my walk. Sometimes I just maybe I think, ah, oh, do you know what? This week I just feel like going out for a walk, and not and not narrating it. But then I think, you know, when people say, oh, look, you know, I really look forward to your Sunday night video. I thought, oh, well, that's really lovely. I, I enormously value that because you start by doing this, and a lot of YouTubers will tell you this, assuming that no one's watching it and no one cares. And I feel like you kind of have to slightly continue with that attitude because otherwise, I don't know, if you feel like it's all very important, <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good attitude. But, um, you know, you have to make these things for yourself, for your own satisfaction. But the knowledge that if it just means something to one person and it, and it gives them a bit of a lift or it helps them through a difficult period, if it's just one person, that's a reason alone to go out and make a video. And then when I, in, in those weeks when I sort of maybe have to push myself to start, by the end of it, they're sometimes the most rewarding videos. They're sometimes the best videos, and they're sometimes the ones that I enjoy the most, like pushing through that little hump. And uh, yeah, that's, I'm not sure that answers the question, but. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is actually a slightly different question from Daniel. There's a lot of pub questions, by the way. Favorite pub of all time, all that I can't really say, you know, I've done my five pubs in London you should visit. But I'm gonna answer this one as well. And it's from Daniel and he says, what are your favorite, most memorable pubs that you have visited on your walks around the Hearts, Essex, North London area? North London one, I'll leave that out because that's part of London. I feel like I've possibly addressed that. Essex, Hearts. Well, the one that comes to mind at the moment is when I did that walk to the source of the River Lee. 
and I went to that pub in the village in, uh, that was, was that Bedfordshire? I think it probably was Bedfordshire. Might have been Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire. Probably was Bedfordshire, wasn't it? Uh, I know it was around the border. And that was, uh, that was a really, they were really friendly in that pub. They filled my water bottle up and a couple of pints of San Miguel on a boiling hot day. It was 30 odd that day. That was really memorable. I think that's, cool, that's a really question. My favorite pub, one of my favorite pubs actually, is Hertfordshire, the Waterside Inn in Ware. So that's gonna be my answer, the real answer. The Waterside Inn in Ware is, that's one of my favorite pubs. I love going to that pub. I will walk from here to that pub 20 odd miles, 23 miles, and uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. When I filmed it, quite a few videos now, I can't justify filming too many walks that end in where. Um, and I will do it, I hope to do it again soon, just on a, on a day when I'm not filming a walk. Walk up from here and end it at the Waterside Inn in where. I might do an event for my book in there actually, I'm really tempted to do that. You can hire the little corner room. Yeah, that would be great. Do you think psychogeography could have a part to play in archaeology? Maybe a different way of looking at past environments? Definitely. I mean, archaeology, I use archaeology to definitely inform my psychogeography. I don't know if the traffic goes back the other way. I get the feeling, understandably, a lot of academic practices can't really embrace any woo-woo because you'd lose your credibility. And I think psychogeography is seen as being a bit woo-woo. If you look at psychogeography as a way of just sensing an environment to maybe give you a different, yeah, like I said, I think it can, I think it definitely has a part to play. Maybe I'd love to have a dialogue with an archaeologist on this, that'd be a good project. Thank you for suggesting that. Maybe if I can find a, like a legit archaeologist to collaborate on something together, maybe as a legit archaeologist watching this who would be interested in that. Um, yeah, that's a great suggestion. I would love to see you walk the River Darren from Dartford to Seven Oaks one day. Would this be an option? Yes, that's been on the list, Aaron, actually. I don't know why I haven't done it. Um, and there's, is it Lullingstow Castle, isn't that along the Darren? That's, that's been on my list for about five years, six years. I've wanted to walk the Darren since I went there for my book, This Other London, in 2012, which is now 11 years, oh my Lord. There you go. Relating, actually, this is a comment uh, someone's made rather than a question, but relating to the question of areas I would return to, to log changes, um, Den points out that Hayes and Harlington's changed a lot since I was last there. They, they were in the process of knocking down the old Nestle factory and that development has moved on. So that's an interesting bit of information and a place I should definitely go back to because I was walking, I think that was the London Loop when I passed through there actually. So I kind of passed through, I didn't really walk around. And I did have a period going right back to when I started to, before I started uploading regular videos, I did a walk along the Grand Union Canal that ended in, in Hayes and I went to a Spoons there. I'd done a long walk on a hot day and I went to the Spoons and had dinner. Good memories. Uh, I think I had the Tennessee burger for the first time. Shows you how good a memory it is. I remember what I had for dinner, my first Tennessee burger. Which I think actually, they're not as good as they used to be, but anyway, another point. I don't want to reinforce the idea that I'm a real fan of weather spoons or never spoons, as some people say now. This video will either be really, really long or it'll be split into two parts. Um, or could even be split into three parts. I've answered a lot of questions. Two, two more sort of pub related questions here. A lot of pub questions this time. I mean, hardly surprising really, is it? Someone's saying, I'm going to the Natural History Museum, Joe the dog, I'm going to the Natural History Museum soon with a mate and wanted to know if you could recommend a good pub. So don't know this area too well. Thanks for any advice. Yes, I can actually, as it turns out. Because um, I lived in Glendower Place in South Kent for about six months in like a one room, me and the wife. And it was our local pub, which is really close to the Natural History Museum. And I will put the name, I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but it's like a five minute walk from the Natural History Museum. It's solid, solid local pub, you know, and decent food, pub grub, nice atmosphere, good beer, nice friendly staff. Yes, I will put the name on the screen. And uh, yeah, that's my pub. And I love this question from Oki. Uh, Is there any such thing as pub etiquette? Where, uh, where who not to strike up a conversation with, where to order food, counter table, We'll be in the UK for a month soon and don't want to be so American while there. Ah, oh, great, Okie. Thanks for asking, by the way. If only more people asked. Um, so I, I have my, go in the comments as well. It'd be interesting because I, I don't think there's a set, uh, I don't think there's a set answer to this in terms of etiquette. I mean, in a pub, you order at the bar, right? So you order all your food and all your drink at the bar. Um, however, a lot of times now you can order by scanning a QR code and it will bring up a menu so you can order from your phone. In a Weatherspoons, which are a chain of pubs that serve very cheap food and, food and beer, 
uh, they encourage you to order via the app from your table actually so some people just sit there drinking pints and order at the table generally speaking the pub etiquette is to order at the bar you should always let if you see someone who's in front of you at the bar who's there before you even if the staff come up to you and ask you what you want you defer you go oh no sorry this person was before me that's a really important thing to do otherwise it feels like you're pushing in because uh, the staff won't always know who's next in queue here's the thing for me what well, this is what i think is pub etiquette and this is gonna this is gonna disappoint and, and uh, upset a few people. I think don't stand and drink at the bar. I really dislike that when people block access to the bar. If there's seats available, go and sit down at a table. I don't like it when people line the bar and make you order over their head or push past them to get served. Don't do that. Sit down, sit down at a chair. I know pubs encourage it because they have stalls at the bar or maybe you can do that if there's a part of the bar where there's just stalls, but as long as there's enough bar where people can get up to it and order their drinks. Because um, I know in the United States sometimes there's a real culture around sitting at the bar and just drinking from the bar. There is in the UK a bit. Some people love it. I know some people are going to be like, oh, I love standing at the bar and having a few. I, I don't stop people getting to the bar to order drinks. <laughs> Aside from that, go in, be polite, please and thank you. Yeah, order and pay at the bar. That's mainly it. I mean, pubs are really relaxed places as well. Who not to strike up a conversation with? I don't think there's any, I don't think there's anything. People will be friendly in pubs. Um, people think Londoners aren't very friendly. They are. It's unusual if you talk to someone at the bar of a pub that they won't talk back to you. They'll generally talk back to you. I would say be aware that they might want to get into a long conversation with you. <laughs> they might come and follow you to your table. They shouldn't do, but um, it does happen from time to time. Great question, Oki. Right, I'm going to walk back to Leytonstone now and <laughs> edit this epic, epic Q&A video. Thank you so much for all those questions. There's amazing questions. I am bowled over and overwhelmed with all the questions you've asked. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for watching the videos, for uh, posting comments, for sharing your memories with me. It means the world to me, it really does. And thank you so much to my wonderful supporters on Patreon, on here on YouTube, the channel members. Um, it's massive for me, it's huge, 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 huge. And so, as I always like to say, <laughs> and it is a walk, I am walking in the Olympic Park. I look forward to seeing the next walk, wherever that may be. Actually, I don't know, I'm gonna film one tomorrow. I have no idea where I'm going, there you go. Someone did ask about how do you plan your walks? How long do they take? I didn't answer, did I? And apologies if I didn't answer your question. It might be because there was a similar question, I answered it in another question, or just simply because there, was so, <laughs> there were so many questions, I actually couldn't answer them all in the end. But I massively appreciate everyone who took the time and trouble to submit their questions. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.